Today's topic is adaptogens. This is a really cool topic, um, really a topical one as well. I feel like there's so much um, in advertising. A lot of people are seeing things in, in supplement industry about adaptogens, um, but it's really not very well understood what it actually means, how it pertains to herbs versus mushrooms, all of these different questions. So I'm really excited that today we've got a panel of experts, different practitioners, people in different fields um, who really have deep insight um, into what adaptogens mean and why this is so important. Um, I'm going to let you guys all kind of go around and introduce yourselves because there's, there's more to it than I can do justice to right here. But just briefly, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Mark Iwanicki, uh, who's a board certified naturopathic doctor, master acupuncturist, uh, Justin Ehrlich, acupuncturist and doctor of traditional Chinese medicine. We've got Don Olson with us, who's a master herbalist and earth scientist. And of course, we have Sky Shelton, who's the founder and creator of Real Mushrooms. Um, so, Shelton, thank you. So, we have uh, interesting different perspectives. And what I like is that everyone on this call has a real like, wide scope of vision. A lot of people tend to, to narrow in and, and focus on one specific you know, aspect of their practice or, the, or their craft. And every one of you... Um, I know has really kind of expanded outward in a way, almost done the opposite and um, has kind of a big picture view. So I'd like to just go around. We can go right in that order, starting with you, Mark. Just give us a little bit of background and um, anything you want to say as it pertains to the topic. Yes, yeah, so I'm a naturopathic doctor and a master acupuncture. I went to school at NUNM in Portland, Oregon, so kind of close to you guys up there out near the Pacific Northwest. They so love that area. Um, my experience with adaptogens is more mostly adrenal adaptogens and using more Western herbs. So I have a lot of experience with ashwagandha, rhodiola, eleuthero, um, using you know minerals and and B vitamins to kind of help modulate the, the adrenal glands. Even use some low dose um, low dose pharmaceuticals and um, DHA, pregnenolone to to kind of affect the adrenal glands. Um, that's kind of my perspective. I've used, I've used some cordyceps and I really like cordyceps. I've, I've seen some, some really magical things even my, myself and with patients, but I'm, I'm a little bit, I would say a little bit more of a newbie to, to, to mushroom use and adaptogens. Um, I'm familiar with their use as immune modulators, use them that way, but, uh, I'm excited to, to be part of this panel, kind of hear from you guys, hear a little bit more about the perspective of using mushrooms as adrenal adaptogens, immune modulators. I'm excited to hear from you guys and, and learn more. Um. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Likewise, Justin. Yes, yeah, so um, I am a practitioner of China, Chinese medicine, classical Chinese medicine. Um, and so my perspective comes in with the use of mushrooms sort of based on this integration of the sort of macrocosm, microcosm, perspective of like okay it helps the specific organ to adapt the lungs or the kidneys or the heart um, but then there are bigger implications for what that means for the body and the system as a whole which is part of the richness of what chinese medicine has to offer in terms of um, that bigger picture of health and how to to really support the entirety of the physical body and as well the emotional or mental body um, and um, Mushrooms, of course, are a huge part of Chinese medicine, and most of the, the mushrooms we get are from East Asia, from China, basically, sort of originally in their use. Um, so there's a, a lot of rich information for how to use them um, in that way. Yeah, yeah, and we're going to get into that, especially with um, you know mushrooms coming from China, what it means for something to be high quality, and kind of why that matters, um, particularly in this in this field. Um, so Don, yeah, give us a little bit of your background. So this is uh, the Aplan Adam, Ganoderma Aplan Adam. And oh, cool. It's called the Artist Conch, so it's probably hard to see in the light, but you can draw on this. So being up in the Pacific Northwest, it's kind of one of, this was given to me by a, a beautiful ethnobotanist named Nancy Turner, who worked at the University of British Columbia. It was my first introduction to Rishi. It was probably back in 1986. And the other thing is that, you know, I've grown the Rishis, and I think that it's, it's really fun when you can, get to know your plants directly because one of the perspectives that I bring is that mushrooms are sentient beings and that we can have a relationship with the mushroom. And so we tend to focus on the fruit, which is very important and very 
you know, the part we use medicinally, but the mother is the mycelium that is in the, in the host itself. And so I literally teach attunement. So I'll take my students and have for since 1980s to the forest and I will introduce them to the mushrooms and we may even do sort of an attunement to the energy of the mushroom. So that's looking at the living energetic a aspect of it. But uh, following on Justin's, I, I definitely um, practice Ayurveda and the energetics. So that's something I'll talk about further in when it's my turn. Um, yeah, that's mostly, and just the relationship, like uh, I have a Rishi growing on a willow and so I have a relationship to both plants. And so I love that kind of, combination of the anti-inflammatory for resentment willow and then the rishi is right there uh, as a part of that energetic so, mm. so I'm kind of looking more into the deeper relationship of the actual mushroom in the environment that we live in yeah that sounds awesome i'm excited to learn more about that as well because just on a call it a philosophic level it kind of makes sense that there's all of these different relationships that really need to be considered right and I think it's so important when dealing with a complex adaptive system like the human body, how, you know, in, in modern medicine, modern medical practice, we're kind of got, we've gotten used to, with all the specialties, breaking the body down and looking at all of these individual components, the heart, the liver, the lungs, the various functions, and sometimes almost forgetting that they're part of this bigger system, right? Um, and the other thing that I'll speak to later is the extracellular matrix. So that's the ground regulating system of the body where in all everything goes into the matrix and the matrix is actually i think the place that adaptogens really work is that's because it's the only part of our body that's in touch with every other part of our body mm. yeah let's definitely come back to that um so mark i want to bring it back to you for a sec um because i think you posed a good question that you shared with me a little bit earlier which is you know maybe just um talking about the difference between um herbal adaptogens and mushrooms as adaptogens. Uh, and, you know, herbs that you mentioned, for an example, are, are just things like ashwagandha, ginseng. I think the ones that people think of that, that come to mind most readily when they think of an adaptogen. Yeah, so, you know, clinically, that's how I've used them, you know, for people with, with chronic fatigue or fatigue-related chronic illness, chronic illness-related uh, fatigue. Um, you know, they come in and, we, you know, we I have looked at... Uh, blood hormones, looking at cortisol, looking at DHA, looking at pregnenolone, looking at those values, and then trying something like an ashwagandha or rhodiola and seeing how those values change and how the, the patient starts feeling better. They feel more energetic, um, they feel more balanced, and they, you know, overall their, their health is improving. So that's you know, been my kind of use, more, more maybe Western kind of clinical use of, of adaptogens. Um, and I've had really good success with those herbs, but yeah, I would say my, my experience with the mushrooms is a little bit more limited. I have used cordyceps in that way as well, as, and I've seen, I've seen cordyceps uh, affect um, lab values in that way. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about the other potential uses of, of the different mushrooms and adaptogens and how, um, how you would use them in clinical practice, or maybe how you, maybe would, you would categorize or you know, when you would use one versus the other. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming with that question. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a good one. Does anyone else want to jump in on that? Maybe Justin, you have some insight? Yeah, I can certainly share some perspective on herbal medicine because that's a, a very central part of my practice and central to Chinese medicine, of course. Um, and one of the things we can look at when we're looking at the function of herbal medicine is there is this rich tradition in understanding that certain medicinals affect certain organs or certain acupuncture channels, certain tissues. And so an herbal medicine that goes to the liver or goes to the lungs or goes to the kidneys or the spleen or the heart are going to help the body to adapt in very different ways because those organs provide different functions for the system as a whole. And so when we look at a substance like cordyceps that has an impact between like the lungs and the kidneys, we can understand how the lungs play a role in the immune response and protecting against external influences of viruses and bacteria. But we can also look at the lung support for oxygenation of the blood and why cordyceps is such a good adaptogen for athletic performance um, and strength building versus something like 
reishi, which has more of an impact on the lungs and the heart, which deal more with sort of the mental, emotional, calming facets of what reishi offers as an adaptogen. Mm -hmm. And so we can, we can learn something about the adaptogenic capacity of a plant by knowing what parts of the body it impacts and then knowing the medical theory of what those areas represent for the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of richness in, in sort of being able to target our adaptogenic choice to the needs of the person rather than necessarily always doing a shotgun approach where we throw every adaptogen at them, which adaptogens by nature are really quite safe and <clears throat> an area where we, we can sort of safely be a little more shotgun in our approach. But um, the argument in Chinese specificity is always more um, impactful in the person's uh, health so yeah um, could you say a little bit about you know um, how you actually apply these prescribing them and then I'd actually like to go around and get each of your take on that because you know from an herbalist perspective from a naturopathic doctor perspective and and sky just from coming from your background mushroom experts um, I'm curious to know you know and this this kind of goes into just the, the whole idea of an adaptogen in general, because an adaptogen, as I understand it, and I have a pretty like peripheral knowledge of it, it's, it's something that you would give, it, it, it's not something meant to either you know, stimulate or suppress a response. The beauty of, a, of an adaptogen, again, as I understand it, is because it's supposed to provide your body back with the ability to self-regulate, whether it's immune modulation um, or blood, blood pressure, um, so, you know, if you're, if you're looking, let's say, you know, Justin, for someone who wants to, let's say, boost their athletic performance, boost their lung capacity, um, how would you think of applying an adaptogen in that capacity? So there's a, a couple ways we can look at it. You know, in, in the, the practice of Chinese medicine, herbs are always prescribed in a formula. They're rarely used individually. Even something like ginseng is rarely used alone. And the idea is that by creating the right blend, you actually can amplify the benefits and make mm. the whole concoction adaptogenic because it really suits the needs of the person in a balanced way. But within a, a concept of, of adaptogens, you know, the, the general idea is that by taking adaptogenic herbs, you're supporting stamina, you're supporting stress response on an emotional level and on a physical level and you're supporting recovery in terms of the regenerative capacities of the body. So you're looking, you know, for like a competitive athlete, you may be looking at this broad spectrum of multiple mushrooms because they all serve a different part of that equation. Um, and then the, the dosage really begins to fluctuate based on the amount of stress that you're putting on the body. If we're just sort of going through day-to-day -day maintenance, that is different than the dosage you would use if you're actively trying to treat a disease or if you're actively trying to support pushing the body to sort of extreme limits, the amount that we need is going to be different. So what I take, if I put mushrooms in my smoothie or I put them in my coffee or something like that, as a daily maintenance is going to be a much lower dose. But if I'm trying to push myself to do an Ironman or to compete in the Olympics or something like that, I'm going to have to take a larger dose because I'm putting a, a heavier stress on the body. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Sky, is that, is that something that, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I find adaptogens just to be fascinating just because of the different aspects uh, that they can, the different effects that they can do on each person. I mean, it's really a person to person um, person to person effects that vary quite differently. I think, you know, if you're talking about something like reishi, uh, some people might find it calming and relaxing or other people might find it quite stimulating. And so the effects really vary uh, on the individual level. And I think that comes back to a lot of different factors where we're getting, you know, internal stressors and external stressors that vary hugely depending off our environments our diets, you know, what's our exercise like? Are we stressed at work? Are we stressed at home? Um, so there's so many different variables that play into that. And that is what really amazes me the most is we can see the feedback from our customers on, you know, things that I would never have thought of 
that they're getting help with. Yeah. And actually, I wanted to kind of cycle back and, and let you guys give a little bit deeper intro. I think we jumped into the conversation. Um, so, Sky, actually, would you give a little bit of background on, on Real Mushroom just so people really understand where you're coming from? Sure. Yeah. So, I'm the co founder and owner of Real Mushrooms. Um, I've got a long history of medicinal mushroom, um, I guess, knowledge. My father, he's been in the medicinal mushroom game for over 40 years. He started out on a mushroom farm back in the 70s. This is my dad, Jeff Chilton, and uh, worked his way up to manage a big mushroom farm. And then he started, created his own mushroom farm. And then as he learned more about growing mushrooms, he found just how hard it was to sell them as a dried product. Um, and it also led him towards just uh, all the Asian literature and so much uh, information that's available in Asia, uh, specifically China and Japan, where they've been consuming mushrooms and learning about these mushrooms for centuries. Uh, and so he started journeying over there in the late 80s and 90s and making contacts and going to specific medicinal mushroom conferences where he was, you know, one of the only white people there uh, and really learning from them. And then uh, by the mid 90s, he uh, brought organic certifiers over to China and helped set up the first organic growers. And then uh, he had one of the first companies, this is Namex, to sell organic medicinal mushroom extracts to the North American market. Um, and so after a lot of conversations with him, when we were looking into the marketplace, we just saw a real lack of quality and transparency about how these mushrooms are grown and how they're processed. And uh, when looking into specific active compounds that uh, most of these mushrooms is the benefits come from these specific actives like beta glucans, uh, triterpenes, or gosterol, uh, things around those nature. We saw huge variance across different products, and um, you know, an expensive product could be like the cheapest product out there in terms of quality wise. And so we really wanted to put out a high quality product, um, measure the specific actives so people knew that they are in the product, so that they could take it with confidence and really open up. Uh, the experience to mushroom growing because a lot of people don't know how that works and uh, don't know a lot about mushrooms and how they get processed and how that gets turned into extract powders. Uh, so we've been on you know a really big pretty much educational journey just to educate the public more about mushrooms, how to use them. Uh, and this is part of how this panel comes in as well. And so I'm excited for everyone to be here and give their own take on adaptogens. Yeah, yeah, no, it's awesome because because for me, like you know, just starting to get you to know you, Sky, and and get familiar with real mushrooms. This is the first that I've really learned about it. Um, I had no idea about the difference between mycelium being grown on grain versus the benefits of the fruiting body, and um, I think I think unfortunately, you know, a lot of people don't or 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 maybe don't have the tools to read past the label when they're looking for or shopping for supplements online. And um, I think people are, are becoming more sophisticated and, and have a sense that, you know, especially when it comes to natural products, that quality um, is important, makes a difference, and that basically the quality of a product will determine the quality of, of your health and the results that you're getting from there. But still, like, their marketing has become very slick, very effective, and people just lack the ability to discern what truly is high quality from, from just something that appears to be good um, on a label. So, um, Don, you, you had mentioned, you know, one thing before that, that I thought would, would be a good dovetail or at least question that I have here is, um, I want to understand a little bit more about the role of the, the mycelium versus the fruiting body, um, specifically with respect to these adaptogenic, you know, properties. Well, I mean, first of all, I want to really say a thank you to Sky and to Jeff, um, you know, Jeff for a long time and, it's really great to have products that you can trust. I mean, this is one of been the challenges of been an herbalist for a long time. And, you know, over the years I've, you know, had been my city, I've had people that were selling products that weren't even the product and stuff like that. And so it's, it's, it's good to know that what you've got, especially with something as important as mushrooms, when people are dealing with things like cancer, before I answer that, I do want to just go back quickly to the, to the, the clinical part of it and the treatment part of it, just because, yeah. Um, I want to follow on Justin's like, yeah, I think one of the challenges and one of the, I don't want to say it's a danger, but one of the things to be aware of is that, yes, yeah, something like Rishi works for the lungs. It works with the livers. It works with the kid. You know, it's like pretty adaptogenic. It's pretty amazing. But 
but you know, like it's better, like if you're really focusing on the lungs, then like he was saying, then we want to use something like Ella campaign that'll actually bring that energy to the lungs. We may want to put a fomentation or a compress on the lungs to bring the blood to the area that we want it. Mm. You know, so the shotgun method is like he said, good for resiliency, good for everyday adapting. But if you're looking at a specific thing, then like it's the liver, then you might want to have milk thistle in that with it when you're trying to, to attack, you know, to get to that direction, or if it's the kidneys, a kidney herb. The other thing in, in Ayurveda, it's really important that taste affects the dosha. And if we're trying to bring back balance, like bitter has a certain quality to it. And so bitter is good for certain constitutions, not good for others. Doesn't mean they can't use it, but that need to put some sweet in there to go with it. You know what I mean? And then also there's like, there's like the butterfly or the hummingbird constitution that's got metabolism going off the top of the map. They kind of need to get their dosage on a more sipping level like a hummingbird. And then there's your standard person who's your fire person who's that, you know, most herbs have a four year life, you know, four hour life cycle, right? Before they diminish in, in their terms. So then you add another one. So one herb three times a day, the traditional Every herb book says it. That's great for the fire people. And then there's the water earth people that have slow metabolism. And they need, and, and the pit is also the standard dosage, whereas the kapha, the water earth person, they need that strong hit. And they need it a couple times a day because they're, they're, their constitution is much slower. So I just wanted to give the people that are listening that idea too that, uh, especially you know if you're using it a long term for resiliency, you don't want to imbalance your dosha while you're doing it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You want to use that advantage of knowing what your constitution is and working with it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, back to the mycelium. Okay, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm, I just want to put like a, a kind of a pin in that part of the conversation to come back to it. Um, maybe ask your opinion, Mark, when we get there. Um, but I just think it's fascinating to hear, you know, this different perspective, to share the Ayur Ayurvedic perspective that a lot of people might not be familiar with, but we realize is so important to layer on these different um, lenses, essentially, to understand the specificity and how to treat people as individuals, not just, you know, two, two caps twice a day, and that's everyone's same prescription, right? Um, yeah, so, so for now, let's go on with the, uh, the mycelium versus the free body. Well, yeah, I mean, I agree with Sky for what the research is now in terms of especially, you know, products that are being sold out in the market. It's like there's no research on the mycelium and it's mostly starch. My point of view was that it's the living entity and so it's more from a shamanic uh, mm -hmm. tuning into the plant. Then that's the part that the fruit just dies. It's like an apple tree, turning into an apple tree by, you know, with an apple. That's not an apple tree, you know. Right. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the tree that's the actual you know apple tree so that's what i meant by the mycelium but the, you know and then you know any of us who've gone into study mushrooms they're totally completely fascinating right i mean they they're all into interrelationship they're how the trees actually live and so so i i, I guess i encourage people to you know, use nature but also go into the magic of nature don't just take a pill and think oh wow well, i'm you know i know reishi mushrooms you know mm. yeah what is it I actually, I'm just asking for myself, actually, because I, I came across this on a more surface level, but I want to dig, dig deeper into it, and I'm not sure exactly where I'd begin my search, but I want to understand better. I guess it's the, the mycelium, the root structure. Is there a, a definition or, or something about the, the overarching principle of, um, I get this almost like this Gaia-like sensation of how mushrooms really work, right? How you can have these massive organisms that we think of like just this, this individual fruiting body as the mushroom, but really it's this, it's this part of a collective organism that can be much, much larger. Um, it's the largest organism on earth. On earth, yeah. Yeah, if there's a mycelium. I think it's the pine tree or the, the uh, aspen tree mushroom that grows on the aspen trees. And it's the, you can see it from space apparently, and it's the la largest living organism on the planet is this yeah. particular one mycelium but yeah i think we're also just touching the surface of it but we're doing a lot i mean there's a lot of research on it now and so you can go in and just get you know fascinating material on just everything these mycelium do and i think we'll continue to be amazed at what they do mm -hmm. yeah justin i'd like to hear your your take a little bit on on just that concept, I know it from, you know, spagyrics as something called the doctrine of signatures, which, as I recall, basically is, is kind of like the, the hermetic law of correspondence, 
Um, but it just, you know, the, the basic idea that you, you use a similar compound to treat a similar compound. So I guess homeopathy is also kind of in line with this, but I'm really thinking of it specifically now insofar as what Don was just saying about the, the mycelium and the complexity of this structure. And when it comes to, um, you know, the concept of, of an adaptogen, one of the first things that comes to mind is complexity. So it's, it's kind of, is there anything that you've come across or that, that you understand from your background as saying that part of the reasons why or how an adaptogen works is because you're using the complex to treat the complex in, in effect? I'd just like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a couple things in there that I can, can comment on. Um, one thing from within the paradigm of Chinese medicine, we know that different parts of the plant serve different functions. And so we'll see with certain plants that we're using the flower, the fruit, the twigs, the bark, the roots, the peel that's around the bark, and they all have very different functions within the body because they are just different. And that is really part of the richness of the herbal medicine tradition of Chinese medicine in really the ability to recognize that different parts of the plant serve different functions. And we know this, of course, on a very basic level in terms of nutrition, that eating the twig of an apple tree is different than eating an apple. You're going to extract different nutritional value from the bark than you would from the fruit. Um, and if we look at mushrooms, we know that the historical research, at least the histor historical empirical evidence, is all with the fruiting bodies. And whether that started because the, the naked eye was drawn to the fruiting body and couldn't see the mycelium that was growing in the earth, um, or because of whatever other reason, but we know that humans historically have always used the fruiting bodies. That has been the priority, even within the Chinese paradigm where they were looking for mushrooms that grew underground, like the poria, like fuling, they still took the fruiting body mm -hmm. um, and found that to be the most sort of clinically useful. But we can also use the medical theory to extrapolate where the fruit is sort of the manifestation of the energetics of the plant in its complete form, where the mycelium is the growth process of the plant that stimulates a growing mechanism but has not yet fully manifested. And so if we're able to sort of choose which part of the plant we're using, we might be able to come up with some research to study the sort of subtleties of the differences between mycelium and fruiting body. But at least as of now, of course, all the, the historical thousands of years of research, empirical, is with the fruiting body. It's not with the uh, mycelium, not to say that that it's not useful, it's just different energetics because the plant is in a different growth stage. Um, and when we, we look at adaptogens, um, you know, part of, part of adaptability is in this concept of not being fixated. If I am fixated, if I am very monofocus, I don't have the ability to adapt. And that is part of that mycelium imprint that happens to us when we use mushrooms because they are beings they are plants they're species of interconnectedness and so mm. they facilitate our ability to adapt by their own nature of being interconnected and by us being able to be somewhat more interconnected with the environment or with another human or with an animal or with a plant we are by by default we are more adaptable and of course we see this in the research around psilocybin and its use with PTSD, which is a form of extreme fixation back in sort of trauma space. And it opens up the mind to being more adaptable to come out of trauma space. But we also see it in a very physical level in terms of the body's ability to adapt to physical stressors, to the exposure to climatic factors, to higher workloads, to higher stress loads. Um, and I think part of how they support our ability to adapt is in that, that way that they keep us bec from coming very monofocused. And we see that their impact in the body is also not monofocused, which yeah. is by default the definition of an adaptogen. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. And that's, that's kind of, um, you know, what I was thinking in the beginning is just like, it really is that the, 
kind of energetic qualities that go into the um, formation of different types of structures and plants. Um, it, to me, it kind of, you know, intuitively makes sense that that would transfer over into their, their effect that it has in the body. But to a lot of people, it doesn't. And, and certainly intuition and, and the energetic aspect, I know, is, is, is a little bit uncomfortable um, for, for a lot of people. So Mark, I'm, I'm curious, you know, your take on this, because you've really been in both worlds. You've been in the energetic camp and really understand it with um, practicing Reiki and then really going deep into, you know, quantum medicine and stuff like that with innovative medicine. Um, and then you went into, you know, uh, you're a naturopathic doctor now. And there was a lot of con more conventional um, training. So I'd like to hear your take on, on you know, how, how can we kind of explain to the, the average person who might be new to this or might might not be, um, you know, so keen to the idea of like these, these um, energetic aspects. How can we explain kind of the, the benefits and importance of that? So, um, yeah, I'm fascinated by, by the energetics, but I'm also fascinated by, you know, a lot of the research that's coming out now on the um, active ingredients and adaptogens and, and how they're affecting the body and how they're modulating the immune system. Um, you know, Sky was talking about beta glucans and other polysaccharides and, you know, the, 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 the levels within the mushrooms that, that affect the immune system, raise natural killer cells, you know, affect macrophages. So I'm really fascinated in that research too. And, and what's exciting is that more and more of that type of research is coming out. Um, I would actually like to ask Sky, you know, his perspective, we were talking about the mycelium versus the fruiting body in terms of beta glucans and, you know, the different sort of act, active ingredients in the, in the medicinal mushrooms where, where you see, um, you know, kind of the, the majority of those components or, you know, how would you classify some of those more active ingredients between those two? Sure. Yeah. So it's pretty complex. Um, I'll try and explain it. So there is quite a bit of research on mycelium, but that typically comes from pure mycelium. And so mycelium, you can grow either on a solid substrate, like a grain per se. Um, so in traditional mushroom growing, they will take um, a mushroom species, uh, they will inject it into a certain substrate. Uh, this could be a liquid or a solid. Um, normally they grow it out on a grain and you get kind of like a myceliated grain log um, that looks a little bit like tempeh. And then um, a mushroom grower would take that and then they'd throw it into uh, sawdust or uh, straw or something along those lines. And then the mycelium will slowly grow it on this main substrate and then they'll start to grow mushrooms. Um, but what has happened in the last 20 years here is they've taken that myceliated grain and they've then taken that and they've dried it and they've powdered it with the grain that's left over from the substrate. And so what we've done uh, back in 2015 was what we tested over 50 different retail products. Um, some of them were mycelium based, some of them were mushroom based and looked at levels of beta glucans versus alpha glucans. And so primary alpha glucans are mainly starches. Um, the mushrooms do have a small amount of alpha glucans. That's typically glycogen. Uh, and so what we saw was like mushrooms would have a very high amount of beta glucan, very low levels of alpha glucan. Whereas when you grew the mycelium on a grain substrate and that grain ended up in the final product, you saw the exact opposite. So very low levels of beta glucans, very high levels of alpha glucans. And so back to growing mycelium, uh, you can grow it in a liquid substrate. And so most of the research out there, when you actually read it, it's uh, based off mycelium that you grow in liquid culture. And so you would take the mycelium, you grow it in, it's like a nutrient bath, so it'd be different sugars, uh, proteins. And at the end of this, uh, you can drain off your liquid and then you have pure mycelium. And so as a researcher, it makes it a lot easier to eliminate different variables if you know you have a pure substance that you're working with. And so that's one of the confusions um, when trying to dissect the mushroom versus mycelium argument is uh, a large grain component in a lot of the products. Uh, and so, but even if you look at, there are certain pure mycelium products. So back in the eighties, um, Chinese researchers were trying to grow Cordyceps sinensis, which is the caterpillar fungus. So this is, probably the most expensive mushroom in the world at over $20,000 US per kilo. Um, most of it uh, gets sold in the Chinese market just because it's way too expensive. Um, it's not gonna end up in any supplement in North America, though there's 
many products that claim to be Cordyceps sinensis. Um, and so in China, they actually ended up growing the mycelium in liquid culture, and that ended up turning into a product called Cordyceps CS4. So if you look up Cordyceps CS4 in the research, you'll find a lot of research on it. Um, so there is some, you know, there is research that supports the mycelium use, but even when we took uh, pure Cordyceps CS4 and we looked at the nutritional profile, we looked at the actives, even then we saw the mushroom had multiple times higher of primary actives like beta-glucans. And these beta-glucans are the main component in the cell wall. Um, so a lot of times people will talk about extracts being actually like concentrations of these compounds. Um, but in reality, uh, the mushroom is going to concentrate these compounds when they grow, and this is going to show up in the final product. And so given that beta-glucans are the main active in the cell wall of mycelium or the mushroom, uh, it can also be a fungal indicator too. Same with ergosterol. So ergosterol is similar to cholesterol in our bodies, and we can use that as almost a marker of fungal matter. So if these are high, we know we have a lot of fungal material there because it's the main component of these cell walls. Um, and that can just be almost a marker. Um, and compared to mushroom versus mycelium versus myceliate grain, because you have to kind of separate it, that out into almost its own component. Uh, we typically see the mushroom with much higher levels of actives. Uh, there's some minor exceptions there, and then you have to dive into the details, whether it's pure mycelium versus, you know, mycelium that's grown on grain. Um, so there's a lot of intricacies and it's uh, difficult to educate people on this when there's so many different, uh, they're getting bombarded with all this different information and it's really hard to sort through it all. Yeah, I'll say, but you guys are doing an awesome job of putting all the research on the site and, um, you know, exposing these studies. And I think just organizing them in a way that's, that's digestible, right? That's important with all the information out there. Um, Mark, does that, that answer your question? Yeah, that, that was awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. That was really awesome. good clarification. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, if any of you guys have questions for each other, that would, now would be a good time to, uh, to fire away. Otherwise, I've got a few more questions here and then we'll turn over to audience stuff. But Don, you look like you want to raise your mushroom there. <laughs> I just want to, like, there's people probably watching that don't, you know, what, what Sky said, they maybe don't understand. But, like, here's the fruiting body of it here. And this is, like, a grain, a block that was, like, probably in a, some kind of grain and stuff. And so you buy this and it's just a block and you then put, and this is a reishi, and you just have it in a moist environment and it'll grow up. But he's, what we're talking about here is this part here, the mycelium, which if you ground up, would have, like Sky said, would have a high percentage of the alpha glucans as opposed to the beta glucans, where all the beta glucans would be up in here. So I just wanted to give a visual demonstration because a lot of people, they've maybe just taken a Rishi capsule, you know what I mean? They don't, and mycelium, they don't know what exactly what we're talking about. And yeah. this could be very large. Yeah, know, which is what we I talked mean, about. <laughs> The labeling side of things is like a whole nother issue. But just to touch further on that, I mean, the story, so mycelium is, it's out everywhere around us. If we're out in the forest, you know, it's gonna be all over the place and it's digesting organic matter in order to gather nutrients for this fungal organism. Uh, and so it's secreting, you know, different compounds because it's having to combat itself against bacteria, other fungi, um, maybe viruses. Uh, and so it's having to create these special compounds, but the thing that doesn't translate over when you're growing it in a lab environment is lab environments is an entirely sterile setting. And so what's happening is you have sterile cooked grain that's getting injected with the mycelium. The mycelium is growing in a sterile environment. It has zero competition. Um, and so whether or not it actually creates these unique compounds to defend itself is, you know, purely speculative. And without testing and knowing what these compounds are, I mean, we've tested for a lot of different compounds and there's even, you know, there's hundreds of different compounds in these fungi um, in which we don't have lab methods to test for, but for the primary markers, you know, we see just a huge difference between the mushroom, which is the fruiting body, and mycelium, which is also called the vegetative body. 
Thanks for that. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. Uh, Sky, I, want, I wanted to ask you about preparations and um, how that affects the beta glucan levels. Um, you know, I know tr traditional Chinese medicine, you know, there's a lot of like liquid decoctions um, that are used versus uh, dried capsules versus, you know, just eating the mushroom. Like what, what um, you know, what have you seen in terms of the different preparations kind of the, that, that works the best? Yeah, so traditionally is like some sort of hot water preparation, like a tea, which is, you know, it's a low level uh, hot water extraction, which uh, Justin, I'm sure, can chime in, chime in on afterwards. Uh, but most of the time, we're all, always dealing with some sort of extraction. So you take dried mushrooms, you grind them into a powder. Uh, they then basically go in giant pressure cookers. Uh, so they're being cooked under pressure. And this is it's pre-digesting the cell wall. So the cell wall is made up of chitin, which is the same substance that uh, crustaceans make their shells from. And we have a very tough time digesting this. Um, so the active components are inside the cell wall. So if we really wanna get full access to those, we want that pre-digested before we take it. Um, so that could be in a liquid form, uh, but we sell all extract powders. So during the extraction process, uh, we then take the liquid, we run it through a spray dryer, which is, I kind of describe it as a giant heated cyclone where the liquid shoots out the top and you have hot air coming up, which evaporates all your moisture, and then you get a powder out the bottom. And so then this is a fully active powder, which you can take. I mean, we get questions from our customers asking, like, does it matter how we take it? And, it, you know, you could have it as a capsule, you could have it as plain powder, you can mix it into food. It doesn't really matter as long as it's already been extracted. Um, so, and then there's other variations into that on how the extraction's done, whether you use alcohol, whether the mark gets carried through. Um, there's a lot of just intricacies there, concentrating to certain ratios. So there's a lot more in depth. Um, Justin, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, um, <clears throat> a couple of things I can comment on in terms of, um, again, sort of the bigger historical perspective of herbal medicine. And something we can extrapolate into modern times very readily is the whole practice of farming makes a very substantial difference in the product that you receive. How you raise an animal, factory farming versus growing out grass fed versus factory farm beef, we know medically speaking behaves in the body very differently. We, and within the history of Chinese medicine, there is um, vast amounts of documented literature showing that how you grow herbs affects their medicinal values so that we know that certain herbs are better when grown in particular ways and it's no different with mushrooms and this sort of points back to don's comment of a reishi growing on a willow tree is going to be different than a reishi growing on a pine tree and the history of chaga growing on birch its function is going to be very directly related to the environment that it grew on and what it absorbed from the tree as it's decomposing some of the material of the tree. We see this with poria, with fuling, where in Chinese medicine we use the plain fuling and we use the fuling that has the root going through it and it's called fu shen. And the function of just the same sort of fruiting body but with the inclusion of the root of the pine tree that it is growing on changes the function of the plant. And it is at least if we're trying to look from historical evidence it points to the importance of how we grow the mushrooms and what parts we're using really does make a difference in their impact all literally all of the history of plant-based medicine says these things are important all the evidence shows that these things are important and so they're just they're definitely something we need to consider it's not to say newer methods are bad we just don't have the evidence to understand their implications the way we do with historical growing methods. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't know that about uh, poria with uh, the root growing through it. I've seen the, mm -hmm. I've seen it being grown. Yeah, uh, so it's on a, called a big log. It's called fuling, fuling or fu shen. Um, shen and for the, body. Shen for the mind, for the spirit. Um, right. Yeah, so that's a good point. I think it's uh, good to note that you know, mushrooms are bioaccumulators. And so depending on what food source you give it, um, it's gonna have different properties. And so um, that could be bad things like pollution, 
Um, so that's always a big concern for us when we're testing for heavy metals and pesticides and things like that. We want super clean environments when we're growing these mushrooms. And also in terms of like the different compounds. So like reishi, they always grow on wood. Um, they don't grow it on sawdust. They don't grow it on grains. Um, so it'll be, it gets more of the actives because that wood is just such a higher density nutrient source. Um, and like you mentioned, chaga too. Uh, so chaga actually pulls out compounds from the birch tree. And so birch tree has medicinal compounds itself, like betulin and betulinic acid. And you find those showing up in chaga and as one of its main active components. Oh man. Yeah. That's really cool. Thanks for sharing this stuff, guys. It's man. It's awesome to think about. And I think it's, it's such an important um, kind of new direction for, to get people to start thinking in. And I say new direction because I think the average person, you know, when they're looking at supplements, like they don't really consider that bioaccumulation effect of where it's grown. Um, they consider it with, with another thing, which is alcohol. You know, everyone knows that like where your wine is grown is going like everything in the soil and the air and the atmosphere is going to affect the flavor of the wine, the health of the grapes and all the rest. Um, but when it comes to the foods we eat, the supplements we take, the medicines, like the same principles are true. And, and if, if anything, just, um, you know, far more impactful on the human body because of the reasons that people are taking these kinds of things. Um, Don, I was wondering if you had anything to add to that. <clears throat> well, a couple of things. I mean, another relationship I had with Jeff is Jeff was actually the person who discovered the garden giant mushroom in the 1970s, which is a garden, a mushroom that they grow with plants to enhance the, uh, nutritive value of the vegetables you're growing, but it's also used to accumulate, bioaccumulate toxins. And so I, for a couple of years, I taught gardening classes with the garden giant mushrooms. And one of the things that my, a friend of mine got a contract with a mine and he was able to go in and create a garden patch with this place where it had been stripped mine. <clears throat> and within two years, he completely restored the ecosystem like there was nothing there, no back, you know, it was like stripped. And within two years of growing this garden with the mushrooms, uh, everything came, the insects came back, the animals came back. It was just pretty, pretty impressive. So I guess that's just another bigger picture of, of what these mushrooms are always doing. They're like restorative and, and they're, they're, they're vitally important for that purpose. I just want to say one other thing about mycelium that I learned that it was really cool. Like I used to go walking in the woods and all of a sudden I have this incredible sweet smell. Like I'd look around, you know, I'd look at trees and plants and I'm herbalist. I identify most plants and couldn't figure it out. And I just love it, you know, realize that lots of times that's actually the mycelium. The mycelium give off a scent. That's probably how dogs mm. can find truffles, but they actually give off a scent. And so sometimes if you're walking in the forest and you smell something, just stop and maybe think that it's underneath you is all this mycelium growing that isn't fruiting. So you don't see any mushrooms, but the mycelium's living and, and you know, the fruiting is like an apple. It comes at certain times of the year. Otherwise it's not there. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. I always yeah. notice in the fall when we're out foraging for mushrooms that there's this different smell out there. Yeah. And you, can yeah. Almost, you can almost yeah. smell the mushrooms. Yeah. If we get good enough, hopefully we could do that. <laughs> 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 yeah, totally man i want to come out there and go on like a nature walk with you guys and uh oh, mushroom definitely. gathering um but don to that same point you mentioned a little bit earlier about um i think it was you who mentioned this about um you know the importance of of kind of customizing the application of these mushrooms or these different types of, of supplements um to the individual and one of the ways that you would do that is by taste right so you mentioned different different doshas we're talking now from the ayurvedic perspective um, could you say I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that I'll, some of the things I'll sometimes do for people that if they're using pills, I'll get them to open up a capsule and sprinkle it on top of the pills. So at least their their their, their body will have a because there's a physiological effect right from taste. Like once you taste something, your body's already responding to it. There's already a physiological change in the body. And this Ayurveda knows this very well. There's also a post-digestive effect, which means after you've digested it, then it has another different effect. But that first effect can be very strong. So, you know, to be, um, Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine are close, but they have a slightly different thing with some of, some of the tastes. But from an Ayurvedic point of view, you know, it, there's so much 
Abel, like I have on my website, there's a, a link to be able to get your constitution if you want. And there's lots of them on the thing. So it's pretty easy nowadays to go and get a rough idea of what you're designed, whether you're the Vata air type or you're the Pitta fire type or you're the Kapha or you're a blend of them. It gets a little more complex because then you do the seasonal thing because you fire, you're going to obviously treat more in the summertime when it's hot, you know. But, but just knowing that basic could, could be good. So if you know you're, and you know, Vata's pretty obvious. They're just like they're buzzy and they're thin and they're skinny. So like, then that would be the case of it's bitter. And if they're using just a bitter, then they might want to use something sweetening that, you know, and again, this is where food can come in. I mean, another thing that if we don't have the proper bacteria in our gut, we're not going to digest anything literally and they've done like siberian ginseng they did research on siberian ginseng and without the proper digestive bacteria the the active constituents were not absorbed so one of the ways that i posted in their recipe book is is i use kefir and again the reason i'm going to elaborate a little bit here but the reason i love kefir is that i grow it on my fridge so it has a relationship with my environment so then i add the rishi into that I like reishi. I like reishi and turkey tails because I, I can they hear. I can have a relationship to them, and I've known I've known them for a long time. I love to study the other ones, but I can't have a relationship with them because I don't, you know, they they don't grow here. So cordyceps and stuff like that. So that's the reason I've had such a good relationship with them because they're always in the forest, and we can we can be playing with them. But so you know, so that 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 modulating. So there's a couple of ways. So the vata can add some kind of sweetness and it could be literally uh 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 like a like it could be in a fruit juice you know what i mean like it could be that kind of thing or it could be like a sweet herb like licorice licorice has some kind of its own you know physiology so you got to be careful out there uh with the pit a bit they like bitter anyway so it doesn't matter so much that's kind of ideal for them and and but i would say that another thing we teach in our herbal course is allies so this a bitter herb might be a really big ally for uh a, a fire sign fire can literally blow itself out like it then a heart attack like it i've known a pitta who died jogging at noon you know like no no relationship to their environment and their constitution so again justin was talking to this a little bit about that's how i loved what he said about the mushrooms and, and adapting and then how sky went on to do that of the mycelium that you know, they're, they're already doing that and that's why they're helping us be more open, which is totally cool. And then with the kapha, like I said, they're, they're, bitter's good for them too, but they really need the pungent. So it would really be good to put some ginger with that. And also to give a, so dosage wise, the vatas would have a smaller dosage more frequently, you know, like every couple hours, cause there's like metabolisms running at a high level. The, the pitta is like a sort of normal three times a day. So that would work. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to take it three times a day, but if you were going to do it, you know, trying to do it, especially therapeutically, then you might do that three times a day. And the kapha would be twice a day, but more stronger dosage. Mm -hmm. and, and you said, Don, that you have some resources on your, your website? That would yeah, be there's, a, there's yeah. a link, I'm pretty sure, to the, to the uh, there's an Ayurveda site for our Ayurveda course, and there's a site there where you can go and do your, do your Ayurvedic dosha. Awesome. And, and figure out it out. And, and like it's anything, it's, it's, you can get a basic thing and as you live with it longer and you learn a little bit more, then you start to s understand yourself more from that yeah. perspective. Know thyself. All, yeah. Always comes back to that. The last um, thing I'll say is that it's all about adaption. So that's the good thing about Ayurveda too is that then, you know, like it's so simple. If you're overheated, take a cold shower. Like, you know, I mean, it's not rocket science. If you're right. cold because you're a vata, put on some clothes, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, we're some, sometimes we're just disconnected from our environment and our bodies and, and from simplistic answers, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, I, I need, I need all that, you know, I need, no, I, I think it's, it's really important. It's like, um, you know, we tend to make things way more complicated in our yeah. present <laughs> situation. But at the end of the day, if you look at some of these, um, you know, simple kind of methodologies, it really comes back to simplicity. It comes back to paying attention to your body, um, forming a relationship with your body and the things that you're going to put in it or on it. Um, and uh, yeah, just being kind of like tuned into that. Um, Sky, bring it back to kind of a ground level now for people that are going to be listening and might be, um, you know, just wanting to get into using more medicinal mushrooms, using adaptogens, getting the benefits of that. Um, Sky, you've, you've created a number of, of products with real mushrooms that are 
um, you know, kind of cater to that simplicity. Like you said, powders, they're easy to use. You don't have to be like incredibly specific with them. What are some of the things that you would recommend for someone who just wants to, to get started adding this to their, their diet? Yeah. I mean, personally, I like our five defenders blend. So that's uh, reishi, shiitake, maitake, turkey tail, chaga, which are kind of the main immune system boosters. So if you just want a really easy one to get started, um, certainly that's a good one to go with. Um, but I, you know, I, the biggest thing I think for people is just to try them, you know, whether it's, you know, a blend, whether it's, you know, cordyceps, lion's mane, reishi, um, and certain ones are geared towards different areas. Um, but a lot of it's, you know, geared to, around these adaptogenic properties and just trying them out. Um, they're going to work well for some people and they might not work for others. And I think that's the fascinating part about them is that every, every person is different. And even as we were talking about dosage too, I mean, some people, I know some people who are taking upwards of 10 grams and someone else who might take a half gram of cordyceps and they're just like, wow, okay, I can, you know, feel that. Mm. Um, and then it's all about, this is, you know, this is preventative, you know, medicine per se, in that um, these are helping us adapt to our external and internal stressors, which can lead to other more serious problems. So it's a preventative measure that is going to take time to work into our systems and really build up and help our immune systems and uh, overall health just be stronger in general to keep us balanced. And, you know, you really want to look at a long-term approach with mushrooms. It's not going to be something like caffeine or aspirin or something where we know what it's going to do and we can, you know, I've got a cup of, cup of coffee here. I know that I'm going to feel something from it within the first 30 minutes. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up because for, for a lot of people, I know that, you know, having a relationship with your body, like listening to your body means those, um, doesn't go much further, unfortunately, than the immediacy of like an influx of caffeine or craving for sugar and just responding to that more superficial, you know, level uh, fluctuation. But what we're talking about here is, is really much, uh, much deeper. It's the ability to self-regulate. And so, um, yeah, I think it's important to, to set kind of um, a realistic, have a realistic understanding of, of what you can, what you might experience when you start to add these things in, that it is cumulative. Um, just in my kind of just basic experience, when I am more dialed into my body, when I'm even like, uh, you know, spending more time in nature and not in New York City, when there's less interference, um, I can, I, I tend to notice things um, much quicker, you know, immediately. They're, they're subtle changes, but they're absolutely changes. Um, whereas if I, you know, in the city with traffic going on outside, loads of caffeine and other stuff, like it's going to be nearly impossible to, um, to feel the immediate effects of something. And that's where those cumulative, you know, benefits are, are going to be something that uh, you have to really respect and, and, and uh, pay, uh, pay attention to. Um, so I do want to turn it over, keep a little bit of time to answer some of the um, viewer questions. We put this out on Facebook, the topic of adaptogens. Um, Can I just say one thing about internal stressors? That absolutely, just quick, yeah. Just this guy. It's very fascinating. In 200 BC, they have records of Japanese monks coming over to our forest because you got to realize Rishi now that it's growing, growing is, is available to everybody. But back in the day, it was for the royalty. There wasn't a, it wasn't that readily available. But the Japanese monks would come over here and live in our forest and, and use our Rishi to in 200 BC. But I only say this because Sky hit on a really important point is a lot of stress is inside. It's internal stresses. And so Rishi was used a lot for meditation. I, I go back to Rishi, but so that kind of combination of using a Rishi in relationship to your meditations. And when we're trying to, as you said, like Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, we're really aimed at a lot of longevity and prevention, which again, Sky alluded to is that you don't wait to get sick to take these adaptogens. You use them and you find your dosage that works for you. But then also they're practiced like something like meditation. But I just wanted to tune people into the fact that so many people doing yoga and all this kind of stuff. These herbs have a, a nice relationship with our psyche. And I'm, and I'm just going to make a plug for I'm writing a new book called The Dream, Dream Maker's Herbal Apprentice. And I only bring that up because two of the factors of that book are going to be listen to your medicine. So, talk to your plants and listen to your body. Your body's dreaming as much as it's 
sick. It's, it's telling us something, it's communicating to us. But I think these mushrooms, when we slow down and get more sensitive, they can take us, as Justin alluded to, they're opening us up, just like he talked about psilocybins, which are very direct, but that doesn't mean other mushrooms don't have a more, you know, a subtle effect that we don't necessarily get, oh, you know, I'm, I'm being affected, but it is being affected. Sorry, I just wanted to put that out there, but we'll come back to it. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah, Mark, go for it. I just wanted to ask Sky a quick question that was on, on your website and I was looking at some of the formulas. I noticed you had a formula for uh, gastrointestinal health with Shaga in it. And I'm, Shaga is probably one of the ones where I'm least familiar with. Um, so my question is, you know, how, how is it kind of used for GI health or gut health? And, you know, how would you describe it kind of that way? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure which recipe that is. That might have been a user submitted one, but um, traditionally, like if you look at it in Russia, they used uh, chaga mainly for a lot of gut issues. And so we kind of gear it more towards gut health, even though there's other, you know, the black outer part of chaga is uh, primarily melanin. Um, so that also helps with our skin. Um, but yeah, they've, I mean, there's so many different aspects to it. I mean, chaga, they've geared towards like, you know, stomach, liver, uh, kidneys along the same lines. Um, I'm sure Justin might have a bit of input on that side of things too. Um, yeah, chaga is such an interesting one. Just, I mean, it's this weird conch and we usually call it a mushroom, but it's not a mushroom in the scientific terms. You know, it's this woody canker that grows off of birch and a lot of the actual tissue is, is uh, birch wood um, that, that we're consuming. Um, so yeah, I, I'd have to dive into a few more studies and just look at it a little more closely, but yeah, traditionally used a lot for gut and like GI type stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Justin, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I can. Um, <clears throat> one of the ways that the Chinese medicine classifies things is according to, you know, the organs which have specific colors or energetics associated with them. And, and chaga traditionally is sort of this orangish yellow, earthy sort of interior color with the black outside and so by law of signatures we can know that black is associated with the kidneys and in chinese medicine all all mushrooms affect the kidneys as sort of a basic foundation and then they are more specific towards other organs based on the the other facets of color um, and so the idea that at least begins the thinking process in Chinese medicine is here is this mushroom with a black exterior and a yellow earthy interior. It's going to point towards the spleen and stomach, the digestive system, the regulation of glucose, the health of the gut, but it also grows in sort of a, a tumor-esque form. And so we know that it's also going to work to help to break down tumors by that law of associations. And that is sort of the the initial thinking process of Chinese medicine, and then they go and they test it. So it's not like Chinese medicine just looks at it and thinks, oh, well, it's a red color, so it's going to affect the heart, or it's a white color, so it's going to affect the lungs, but it's, it starts the thinking process or the testing process to figure out how do we want to test this and what do we see change in the pulses when we give it to the person, or what do we see change in the tongue, or what do we see change in the clinical symptoms when the person consumes it to help validate our theory, because you know, medicine's always sort of, as you know, it's a working theory, and then we give something, we treat, and we try to measure the results to see if our theory is correct. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That is that is kind of the, the the way you work with a complex system, right? Little little inputs, see what effects come out, and then try and uh, form an understanding of of what's causing those. Yeah, um, yeah. awesome. Is there anything else before we jump into the uh, the user questions let's do it yeah. let's do it all right let me pull these up so these were put out on facebook a little while back let's see first one comes from zilla zilla billa <laughs> um no joke so uh she says would be would be good to hear thoughts on long-term use um also anything that affects autoimmune disease would be interesting too um yeah let's kick it up there maybe sky what are your thoughts on that like you know adaptogens for long-term use is there um, any sort of strategy you'd want to use to cycle or is it fine for long-term use? Yeah, like I touched on before, it's just really consistent use over long periods of time. You don't need to cycle. You don't need to go 
on and off. You know, it's this kind of constant buildup in our system where we're really trying to keep our bodies in balance so that when we do have these internal and external stressors, you know, our body can act immediately and really deal with that. Um, what was the second part there? Was um, The second part was kind of unrelated, but it's just about um, the effects on autoimmune diseases. Mm, right. Yeah, there is um, a little bit of debate there with uh, autoimmune conditions. Some people say you shouldn't have mushrooms. Um, it seems like more and more of um, some health professionals are saying that they're okay for uh, autoimmune conditions, uh, but it really, I think it depends on the person itself. Um, so yeah. I would just play with that. I mean, certainly they can help in certain situations, but you would just want to try it out and, you know, start small. Um, a lot of people go too heavy too quickly. Um, but yeah, just, you know, slowly introduce it, whether it's, you know, as a supplement of some sort of extract powder, or if it's just adding more mushrooms to your diet, because those are just a great food in general that all of us should be eating more of. Yeah, totally. Mark, what's, what's your take on that? adaptogens for autoimmune diseases? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, when you look at, um, you know, the immune system and modulating the immune system, when you're dealing with something like cancer, where you're saying maybe you have an underactive natural killer, natural killer cell activity, and you're wanting to kind of stimulate that, and you're using mushrooms, using the active constituents to kind of boost the immune system, whereas in autoimmunity, you've got sort of a haywire overactive immune system, and it's like, do we really want to be pushing more immune response and more more natural killer cell activity or you know so i don't know i think it's interesting i think you know you know because of the the adaptogenic or the immune modulating effects of mushrooms i think more and more research will will maybe show that mushrooms will be beneficial for that autoimmune kind of lowering the, the immune response rather than kind of activating it um but you know with anything you, you start off slow like you, like this guy said and kind of See how the patient responds. You know there are, there are markers you can you can track in autoimmunity to see how well they're doing. Also clinically hit their symptoms how well they're responding. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of a good approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just to add to that, I know one of our employees uh, takes one of our products for her seasonal allergies. So it's um, you know an immune response of an overactive immune system, not like a specific autoimmune condition, uh, but a very low level and you know typically they talk about mushrooms for like helping, you know, get rid of a cold or um, so you don't get sick, but that's kind of the other side of that adaptogenic property of somebody say with allergies and helping out on that side of things too. Right. Whereas allergies, it's like, it's like an overactive immune response that's causing the, the histamine reaction in the first place. So yeah, this is something that's interesting. And it, it's, I think it's, it's one of the main reasons what makes adaptogens so interesting because people kind of have difficulty wrapping their head around it. We're so used to, you know, a one-to-one -one kind of correlative effect of things where if you need to, um, you know, boost something, you give it to stimulate it. If you need to reduce something, you, you take something and it suppresses it. Whereas here it's like, you can take literally the same thing. It can have a stimulatory effect or a sedating effect kind of based on what your body is calling for. So it is, it is a really interesting property. Um, Allegra says, do any mushrooms have amphoretic qualities? Um, she says the formal definition for this quality relative to herbs is a normalizer, an herb which harmonizes and normalizes the function of an organ or body system, balancing two, this is what we were talking about, balancing two seemingly contradictory conditions such as diarrhea and constipation or high blood pressure and low blood pressure. So the question I, that started that, that off was, do any mushrooms have an amphoretic quality? Um, that's a new one for me. So, Sky, you want to take it? Yeah, I haven't heard that term before, uh, but it sounds almost exactly like what we've been talking about. With, yeah, it, uh, sound, it sounds like that's just basically kind of the definition of, of an adaptogen, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, yeah, it's just important in what, always amazes me just every single week from the feedback that we get of the difference in experiences that people have with these mushrooms and herbs in general. And like you're just saying, you know, you can take the exact same thing and it really depends on a person to person level of the effects that they're going to have. And it, it could be completely polar opposite, or it could even just be small fine tunings of the same thing. Um, and it really depends, but yeah, I think they definitely have, uh, those type of qualities like she was talking about. 
Yeah. Yeah. Don, you have anything to add there? Well, no, I just, yeah, I've, I've, I've something to add and something and a question for Sky. The first thing that I would add, like I'm, you know, mostly very familiar with the Rishi mushroom. So one of the things that Rishi is very powerful for is it's an anti-inflammatory. So we've been talking about adaptogens, but the, the inflammation response is like responsible for so many, you know, all your itises, you know, that's your know, arthritis, your So, you know, and, and if you look into the depth of the, the anti-inflammatory response of Rishi, it's, it's pretty deep in there. So it's a, really is, I think, a very systemic, very powerful anti-inflammatory. So that in itself is going to reduce all kinds of, of conditions. I do want to say a couple, two things. One is um, I'm a friend with uh, uh, Christopher Hobbs and we've done quite a few mushroom workshops together teaching and he suggests maybe once in a while going off the mushroom. I mean, I'm a, I'm a believer of taking everything all the time, but he, he says that receptor sites might get a little bit used to the the, the, the um, ligands, the, the, the ones that trigger the receptor sites, or to var vary it. So if you like, you know, Rishi for like X amount of time and then take Chaga for a little bit. I'm, a, I'm playing around with that, but I finally stopped Rishi for a few, <laughs> for a week or so, but it's like, yeah. So I, I'm just putting out that, the, you know, I, I put that out to anybody else too. That's what the research is, but that was his thing. But the other thing, Sky, is like, what, uh, as far as an anti-inflammatory uh, response, what are the other ones like? Is there one that you favor more for anti-inflammatory? Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. I feel like they all have anti-inflammatory properties. I mean, if you look at um, like cordyceps militaris, uh, one of the marker compounds in there is cordycepin. Uh, and so that's an anti-inflammatory compound, also a partial precursor to ATP production as well. Uh, but if you kind of read some of the overarching literature, um, they talk about, you know, a hundred different medical functions. Uh, so there's just so many different facets here and it could be anti-inflammatory. Um, I mean, there's anti-tumor, um, all the immune side of things, uh, cognitive, you know, tie-ins, um, so many different facets where it can impact our bodies that, I mean, it's <laughs> hard to really focus on one of them other than I think the overarching immune system is a big part of that just because it has so many, um, it affects our body in so many different ways and we can fine tune into that, whether it's, you know, inflammation or um, um, other, yeah, different ailments. Yeah, inflammation is, is at the root of everything, isn't it? Like there's nothing that it doesn't affect. Yeah, Justin. Yeah. So I think, you know, if we look at the, kind of going back to the, the bigger picture of an adaptogen and long-term taking, one thing we can we can look at is there are certain medicinals that are really good and powerful for short-term use but are toxic for long-term use and there are medicinals that actually improve their function when taken over a longer period of time so that taking them for two years you will get more benefit than if you took it for two months and adaptogens mushrooms fall into that category and that was in the foundations of Chinese medicine, they outlined it in the sort of first herbal medicine book of lower, middle, and upper grade medicinals. Upper grade being the category that reishi and medicinal mushrooms fall into, which are really things designed to be taken for extended periods of time to reap or harvest the full benefit of what they offer. But within that, you're still also meant to follow the the patterns of nature, which is a certain cyclical pattern, meaning you may take something for years, but it's going to be in variation where you take a certain type of mushroom at one time of year, you take a different type of mushroom at a different time of year, because what the body needs to adapt to in relationship to the external environment is changing. The type of support I need in the cold of winter and the type of support that I need in the heat of summer is different. I can still benefit from the adaptogenic capacity of the mushrooms, but situationally my needs are different. So hence my choice of mushrooms should, should vary. Um, but yet I can keep taking things as a way to support the system. Um, and going back to the autoimmune perspective, you know, I think one of the things we want to be careful with when we're looking at medical disease is that it's much more complex and it really, deserves the respect of being individualized treatment, not 
generalized treatment. And we can benefit from the use of adaptogens to help us adapt to the process of disease and to minimize some of the intensity or some of the flares, but we don't want to project onto something that it's a cure because that process is, is really far more complex than just taking one supplement that helps our body to adapt. Um, and uh, there is this propensity in the Western mind to look for the next big cure. And um, the conversations I, I have with my clients all the time is really trying to like slow it down and let's come back to you and to your specific needs rather than just looking for this sort of panacea where they just we, we haven't yet found something that is a panacea yeah 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 i'm curious to know uh, sky go ahead i was just gonna say i totally agree yeah um mark i'm curious to know from from your perspective like if you've um experienced the same thing patients that generally um are looking for you know cure a protocol um things of that nature without the, the understanding that we're dealing with such a dynamic system and process right yeah i mean i think everyone's looking for the magic bullet you know they want that one thing that's going to transform their lives you know whether it's you know the new hottest trend product or you know whatever it is or the new diet that everyone's talking about but you know health is a lot more complicated than that and uh, everyone is different too you know like like we said earlier you can give an adaptogen to one person and it, it actually you think it's gonna you know kind of uh, modulate their system, but actually winds up throwing them off and they get hyper and they get too anxious, you know? So I think, in, you know, like uh, Don was saying, with individualizing uh, our treatments through uh, Ayurveda or through Chinese medicine or a way to getting at kind of the core of that particular person and what's gonna help them, I think is key to, to kind of long-term uh, healing and wellness for, for, for patients. Um, and that not, not everything is gonna be a magic bullet for everyone. And so, um, yeah. 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 This is such an important, like, you know, concept. And, um, I don't know, maybe it, maybe it negates the, the last question that, that we have here, um, which is, a, you know, again, about kind of a specific condition. Um, but I'll just kind of read it off and see what, what insights you guys have to share on it. Uh, Myra says any studies done with adaptogens on diabetes or women's health issues. And she mentions autoimmune as well, but we covered those. Um, but yeah, stuff like diabetes and women's health issues. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of assuming she means anything hormone related. Um, Justin, any, any insights there or anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, there's been some in, interesting research around um, maitake mushrooms and regulation of blood sugar. Um, the association with the spleen and stomach with chaga will show, uh, I'm sure, a certain degree of benefit for regulation of, of blood sugar as well. Um, and really, technically all of the mushrooms are going to have some benefit because of their just nature of being an adaptogen. Um, but as far as research that's out there, I think the strongest case would be for maitake mushrooms, um, at least right now. Um, and as far as hormone health, you know, hormone health and autoimmune disease, what I would argue, what Chinese medicine would argue would be that what you want to identify is what's throwing the hormones off and treat that rather than thinking of the mushroom as treating the hormones, even though they can have the benefit of that. We want to really identify what's throwing the person's hormones off and then select medicines from that space um, versus from the other direction. Um, and so all of them have the capacity to influence that, but what an individual person needs is going to be very different. Um, just because what's throwing it off is different. Yeah. Sky, you got something to add there? Yeah, definitely just want to reiterate maitake, um, shiitake as well, I would say. Uh, even reishi, I mean, if you look at reishi and uh, diabetes, or uh, there's definitely papers on anti-diabetic effects of reishi. Um, I'd say, you know, put more mushrooms into your diet in general uh, should help. And even, I think, Oyster mushrooms, like they have low levels of statins, uh, which could could help out. Um, yeah, I think yeah, it's a tricky one. I think certainly just eat eat more mushrooms if you can and and see how you feel. And I think that um, certainly could help. And if you just do a couple of quick searches, you should be able to find some literature on that. 
Um, in terms of hormones, I haven't seen as much uh, research on that, but that'd be a bit, a bit trickier. And I think there's probably better approaches. I don't know, maybe Mark might know a bit more about the hormones, I think, or Don. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just want to address a couple things. Uh, first, you know, we really want to make people aware that we're a whole system. We're not just a physiological system. So like for hormones, for example, relationships can affect hormones dramatically and, and cause inflammatory processes. <laughs> I had a woman come to be a, with debilitating PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, and ended up divorcing her husband and her PID went away. <laughs> she had a very inflammatory relationship. But I just want to say that. And then the same with blood sugars. It's like, you know, be aware that we're, a, we're a, an open, nonlinear system that fluctuates far from equilibrium. So we're always taking things in. So, you know, if you're, you know, it's not that complicated to balance out your sugars just by eating a little bit more moderately. And so don't totally rely on the herbs to, you know, to relate to, to regulate that. But then, you know, therapeutically, as far as hormones go in most of the work I've done with women is like one of the first things I agree with Justin, we want to look at the whole person and all this stuff, but one of the most key factors in hormones where the, I think the mushrooms do come in is the liver. You know, the, the liver is what processes the excess uh, hormones, especially in things like menopause. So, you know, and the beauty of I, the beauty of using something like reishi, again, it's my go-to mushroom, is not only are you getting the regulatoriation of the, uh, of the liver, but you're also getting the lungs and you're getting the immune system and the heart. <laughs> you know, it's, it has this beautiful adaptogenic thing, which we were talking about. And then you can ask, you know, you could add, you know, specific herbs like chase tree or dong kwai, you know, depending on the dosha to, you know, focus more on the, uh, so I think it could be a great ally for almost any condition in used in judiciously and intelligently with some kind of knowledge of energetics, for example, or even pharmacological knowledge, you know what I mean? Like, so that's, I think it's a great, yeah, I love, love mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. I want to go get some after this. Uh, Don, you mentioned the word uh, rely. It kind of jumped out at me because um, in this day and age, I think a lot of people are kind of concerned with this idea of down regulation. And this feeds a little bit into our question about, you know, um, taking adaptogens over the long term. Um, people are kind of, you know, worried that if they, if they take something over the long, her long term, first of all, they're going to rely on it such that if they pull it out of their supplement regime or their diet, um, things are going to go haywire. Uh, or, you know, secondly, and part of that is that it's going to have this like down regulation effect um, that's going to like push other parts of the body kind of to stop kicking in and doing their part. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, again, I'll come back to what Justin was saying in, in the study of Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine is like we have to take a seasonal perspective. We have to take a, a relationship aspect to our to our life. So, you know, there may be, you know, I think it's good, really good times if we're not in high stress, which I don't know if those exist anymore, but if we do have a little bit of period with no high stress, then we could go, maybe go, we're on vacation, well, let's not take our reishi, you know. I try to tell people in the summertime, as much possible, have fun, you know, you know like be on a really strict regime in the wintertime. And, and what Ayurveda says that toughest times for the physiological body are the transition times transition between seasons because we're going from a hot environment to like a cold environment we're going from a cold environment to a warm environment and so and there's actually that's backed by science if you look at all the physiology that happens at that time is strong then also i don't know about the other practitioners but you know probably a huge percentage that came to me in i'm not in practice anymore because i'm in my 70s but uh i guess i could still be but i'm I, i'm counseling i'm mentoring other students to do do the consultations but so many people came to me during transition because and then what we're talking about now is the stress modulating ability of these mushrooms and that i think is is is, is one of the key factors and again what i found as a practitioner in all types of medicine that i use is because when the body's out of really they they really work well when they're really needed as opposed, I mean, the tricky with reishi mushroom or the adaptogens are like, we're, we're kind of building resiliency for when it's needed. But when somebody's in the hyper acute state, then that's when, whether it's using 
specific herbs or using and, and using mushrooms then specifically you know you want to then bring the person out of that hyper state that they're in acute means it's a, it's hyper it's active and stuff like that so that's been my experience and i th you know then again i'll come back to the ayurveda is about longevity and prevention and life enhancement and then treatment so and i think mushrooms answer your question in the long term i think i would err on the side of using them and not using them myself but then i would look at times when i could you know not need them as much because i'm not just I'm not feeling as stressed out. And also, what are the other factors that I, if I'm stressed out, that's my responsibility. You know, I like stress, I mean, I love challenges. So it's, I tend to thrive on a certain level of stress. I, I'm always pushing the envelope just because that's my nature. Yeah, no, it's, it's embracing and, and respecting the fluctuations of life and accepting yeah. life as a dynamic process that, you know, so often we, we get caught in, in wanting, like Mark was saying, that magic bullet, that protocol, and, and there's an assumption that goes along with that, which is that even if we got a protocol or a magic bullet or a supplement or something, um, that things would always stay the same, so that thing would always work, right? But it's like the very nature of life is that everything is fully dynamic, completely changing. And um, Well, the, the body's an open, non-linear system that fluctuates yep. far from equilibrium, and we're not a freaking machine. We're not a bicycle. <laughs> we're like a living organism that is hugely miraculous, People ask about miracles. I say, don't look any further than where are you sitting, man. Just You're think about it. it. Just think yep. about it, you know. Um, so awesome. I forgot my second thought to that. But no, that's, that's, that's perfect. Well, we're right at the 90-minute <laughs> mark. So um, if no one has anything else to add, we can, we can definitely take a few more, more comments oh. a little bit. But yeah, go. go I'll go add ahead. a little comment as far as the long-term use. One way that, that maybe we can frame it to understand the impact of mushrooms um, in a slightly different way would be differentiating between medicines that we use to treat disease versus things we take to strengthen the body. Things that just strengthen the body don't weaken the body if you stop taking them. They don't shut down processes of the body. They refine the processes of the body so that they work more efficiently. Things that we use to treat disease override the processes of of the body to direct the body to do a specific action which is needed medically and those things taken for a long time can cause some side effects some sort of chronic problem and that's again going back to the language of chinese medicine would be considered a lower grade medicinal something that is designed to override and direct the body versus something that is an upper grade that just enhances what is intrinsically there just like exercise does just like meditation does just like all of these sort of upper grade lifestyle choices we can make that just enhance things rather than um, shutting it down. And mushrooms fall into that category, basically. Mm. Yeah, that's an upper grade. No, that's, that's, a, that's a really good distinction. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and Chinese medicine or in Taoism, they're considered medicines of cultivation rather than medicines of treatment would be another way to, to language it. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. I just want to say something along that line is food is your medicine. So you're thinking it more like food, but I love that Justin cultivated, but I just want to put a plug out there for my tacky. If nobody's ever eaten them, they're freaking delicious. They're just delicious. I mean, I can get them. There's, there's a company that in Japan that grows them organically and they are available in the bigger city. I don't have them on Pender, but whenever I can get them, Oh my God, they're just, that's the medicine that all these other ones we're talking are conks. You know, you know, you know. I can chew on turkey tails because they're soft enough and suck out the juice, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna eat it. So I just want to put a plug in for anybody out there. Try my tackies; they are <laughs> yummy. My tacky sounds good. Yeah, um, good. All right, awesome guys. I really appreciate it. I, I just want to go around and and have you guys just put a plug in for yourselves now. If, you know, just let everyone know what you're up to, where they can find you, anything you're working on. Um, go for it. We'll start with Mark. Um, before I do that, I just wanted to say I really love what Justin said about the medicines of cultivation. If you ever wanted to write a book called The Medicines of Cultivation, I would be your, your oh, first, sign me up. <laughs> first customer. Yep. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so uh, uh, right now, um, if you just find more information, uh, my website, Um I'm pretty active on my Instagram as well, uh, Dr. Mark Ivanitsky. Um I'm not currently, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm still working part-time for my practice in San Francisco. I just moved back to New York, so um, managing patients remotely, but um, I will be shortly uh, 
likely making some announcements about joining a practice in New York. Um, so just uh, look out for that on, on my socials and uh, website. Awesome. Thanks, man. Good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah, Justin, go for it. Uh, yeah, you can find me on my website as well, just justinerlich.com. Um, and I work with people online and in person here in San Diego, but also distally. Um, and a huge focus of my practice is the cultivational side, the, the Taoist influence of how we can use plant medicine to open up our mind, to work with our physical body and our sort of emotional journey of the, the bumps and bruises of being human. Um, yeah. So a, a big big part of my approach is giving people teas for their mindfulness or meditation practices, um, which is very much the Taoist cultivational thing. And there's no book in, in the works, but, but maybe at some point when I uh, have maybe another 30 years of, of clinical experience, then there will be something worth writing for sure. Yeah. And I'll just say that I've tried the teas. I've used them. And, and Justin, you've, you've coached me through it a little bit, the process of how to align the use of the tea with a specific type of meditation that you call yeah. two-pointed awareness. Um, and I can attest to the, to the power of that, that it's just a really um, kind of amazing thing that certainly does fall into the realm of adaptogens insofar as, you know, your ability to just kind of modulate the stress in life. Um, so it's, it's cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Don, you said you were, you had a book in the works. Yeah, what, I was going to say, uh, so people can find me at grassrootsherbalism.com or on Facebook at grassrootsherbalism. And so we also have an online community now where I teach students and I also mentor students. And so we're going to do an Indiegogo campaign starting shortly and to raise money for this book, which is the Dream Makers, Dream Makers Herbal, Herbal Apprentice, the Dream Makers Herbal Apprentice. So what that means is the dream maker, you could say the creator, and it's, but the dreaming that's going on, uh, I've studied that for a long, since 1986. And and studied shamanism with, with various shamans in the world. So it's combining the herbs and the, and the dreaming part of it. And an application, my first book, Pathways to Healing, A Guide to Herbs, Ayurveda, Dream Body, and Shamanism, has a lot of exercises around learning the, these things. This book will be geared more towards putting it into practice. How do you put it into practice? So, uh, yeah, and then we have a free clinic, too, for people that want to do a supervised clinic for my mentees so we do it online so people come to my website they'll if they go to the mentorship site or the the herbal clinic button they can sign up for a, a, a clinical thing i supervise it but my mentees actually can do it so that i can help them learn how to do the consulting awesome yeah sounds great uh sky tell us what's going on with real mushrooms <laughs> Ah, well, uh, so yeah, we've got organic mushroom extract powders and uh, powder form capsules. You can find them on our website, realmushrooms.com. Uh, we do a lot of stuff on the socials as well, like in this video, uh, for one thing. Um, so yeah, Real Mushrooms on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, we've also got an online Facebook group, uh, mushroom community called the Real Mushrooms Insiders that you can join up to, uh, where we just talk about mushrooms. Um, and so... Yeah, if you want to join there or shoot us any uh, questions as well, hello at realmushrooms.com. We're always happy to help people out there. And I just want to, you know, thank Mark and Justin and Don for coming on here and sharing their expertise. I thought, you know, everything was awesome. And I think that we could go a lot longer if we wanted to and dive into so many more different little niches. Um, so maybe we'll have a spinoff later off this. But uh, this is, yeah, been a great, great uh, chat. Agreed. Yeah, a lot of great topics that we got into here. Mark, what's up? I just wanted to ask Sky real quick. Are, are you in any of the uh, online uh, dispensaries like Fullscript or uh, any of the Nature's Partners or anything like that? We are just in the process of doing that. Um, so yeah, I've got uh, an ND buddy of mine who just came on board and he's helping us out with the practitioner side. Uh, we just hit, I believe, 400 practitioner accounts. And so that's growing every month, but now we're starting to yeah, focus on some of those uh, practitioner dispensaries specifically. Um, so yeah, that's been super fun. And it's been a, yeah, a pleasure getting to work with different practitioners and just seeing the results that they're getting with their patients. I mean, it's awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much, guys, and special thanks to, uh, to you, Sky, and to Real Mushrooms, because uh, that's what's responsible for bringing us all together and having this conversation. Um, 
yeah, we'll, we're going to post all this on the website, different um, uh, links to different conversations and things like that. And of course, we'll have the info for all of you guys as well, your bios. Um, if there's nothing else, then thanks so much. And uh, it was a great chat. All right, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Good Bye -bye. to see you guys.